Welcome to the Ghostly Gallery podcast. It's a place where we explore the world of horror in film, literature, and popular culture. Well, hello once again, everybody. My name is Bruce Markison, and as always, I'm joined by producer and co-host Tracy Asteria for this week's program. Tracy, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing really well, Bruce. How are you today? Doing well. By the time that this show airs, we'll be past the craziness of Halloween. October has been just a an absurd month for both of us in terms of our schedules. Been a lot of fun, but uh, I guess it'll be nice to rest a little bit after Halloween. Today, we're very pleased to have as our guest Mark Olshaker. He is an Emmy Award winner, a screenwriter for the terrific Netflix TV series Mind Hunter. He's a prolific author. And he's also an expert on Rod Serling, who is actually a personal friend of Mark's. Mark has authored numerous books about the FBI, and he has also written several novels, too. He has quite the list of accomplishments. I should mention, I first met Mark at the Rod Serling convention in Binghamton. It was a little over a year ago. Uh, it was back in August of 2022. That was a real thrill for me. So this will be the second conversation that I've had a chance to have with Mark. This will be Tracy's first. Mark, welcome to the Ghostly Gallery. How are you? Thank you, Bruce. Um, I'm okay. I just have to uh, make one correction in your introduction. Uh, I wrote the book that the series Mind Hunter was based on. I was not the scriptwriter. That is true, yes. Uh, but much of what you wrote became the basis that's, for the show. That, that's true, and yeah. uh, we were we were very pleased that uh, um, a lot of the lines from the book uh, ended up uh, in the script itself uh, for the various seasons um, being uttered by the main characters. Well, you're very humble, but um, I, I want to give you extra credit. I. Obviously, the show could not have happened uh, without you. First of all, Mark, I want to talk about the fate of this Mindhunter Mindhunter show. For a while, we've heard talk that the show has been canceled after its two-season run, 19 episodes on Netflix. But then earlier this week, there was an article at a website called The Vulture, and someone there interviewed someone at Netflix saying that well, the show could still be brought back maybe in a few years. What's the latest that you're hearing? What What is your take on what's going on? Well, my take is that uh, the writers never know anything in, until it actually happens. We've been hearing these rumors for quite some time. I can tell you that the uh, actors would love to do more. Uh, originally, David Fincher, the executive producer, uh, came up with an arc for five seasons. Um, so far, there have been two. We've been hearing rumors about uh, a third season and maybe more for quite some time, but uh, um, we really don't know. Um, the, the Netflix holds it pretty close to the vest, and uh, they claim that uh, even though the reviews and uh, were excellent for the show. I think we had like a 97% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, In spite of that, um, they didn't quite get the audience they wanted, and it was an expensive show to produce. So that's the latest we've heard. So um, um, we still hope it's not been officially canceled, um, and it hasn't been renewed either. So there's still a chance, which is good. Here's what I don't understand, Mark, and mm-hmm. and I know that you want to be diplomatic about this. Maybe I don't have to be as diplomatic. Mm-hmm. The show is so good. It has received such critical praise. I don't understand why companies like Netflix don't bite the bullet on a lower rating show that generates so much critical praise, so much good publicity for the streaming platform. I mean, does... Does every show have to be a killer in the ratings? Can't you keep some shows that are just critically good? Is the uh, the older I get, the less I understand about the world. Uh, so <laughs> I I agree with you. Um, and here's uh, here, here's a little perspective since you uh, since you mentioned Rod Serling, my uh, my mentor and uh, hero and friend. Uh, the Twilight Zone was on for, I think, five or six seasons. Um, 
they averaged um, about 35 million viewers uh, in an era when there were considerably less population in the United States than there is now. Uh, and they were always in danger of being canceled because uh, of the mediocre showing. If you got 35 million viewers to day uh, with the 350, 330 million people in the United States, if you got 35 million viewers a week um, on a show that wasn't, you know, the Super Bowl or, or sports, you would be thunderstruck. I mean, uh, the cable shows get, you know, anywhere from like 600,000 to a million and a half. Uh, so everything is, everything is relative and um, it's whatever the expectations turn out to be. You know, I look at a show like this, and even if the ratings weren't great, the reviews have been terrific. Yeah. Netflix will will have the chance to air shows for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And we often hear about, you know, if a show's been on three seasons, it's a lot easier to do it in syndication. Mm -hmm. And you think about this kind of a show over the long term. Maybe it doesn't draw the immediate ratings. But over a 10, 12, 15 year period, if you have four or five good seasons of the show, and there's little doubt that David Fincher had material to do this, as you indicated oh, a moment ago. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it seems go, to me we're going to go 10 seasons as far as material goes. Yeah. It seems to me that long term, this would be a good thing for Netflix. And this would be maybe another argument that, that Fincher or someone else could make. You know, I would think so. Uh, I saw on probably Facebook at one point there was a petition to uh, to bring it back, and uh, I noticed it, so I said, "Well, I might as well add my name to it." And there were already like forty four thousand people who had signed. Um, so, yeah, I think that I think there is an audience for it, and uh, it was a very intelligent show, uh, very well done. I thought uh, we loved the actors. Um, they loved the show. Mm -hmm. What more can I say? For those who are not familiar with the show, and we highly recommend you watch it, 19 episodes so far over two seasons, Mindhunter is based on the real-life work of FBI agents John Douglas and Robert Ressler back in the 1970s, profiling a number of prominent serial killers. And although the lead characters in the show are fictitious, they, they are certainly based somewhat on these agents. And sure. based on the research that you did with your longtime friend, John Douglas, who is now retired uh, from the FBI. So the book that you wrote really about John Douglas and his experiences, I believe that came out in the 1980s. That essentially the 1990s, 90s. That became the basis for what we've seen on Netflix, correct? Right. When you look at what has come about with those 19 episodes and and how things have developed, has it been a real eye opener for you working with television, working with streaming service? Is this something totally new to you? Well, to a certain extent. I mean, I've I've written um, novels and part of my career, as you mentioned, was as a documentary filmmaker. So I'm I'm not unfamiliar with the filmmaking process. Um, and so, uh, you know, I know to a certain extent how Hollywood works and, uh, and doesn't work. And we never expect anything until it actually happens. I've been hired to write other films before that I was paid for, but, uh, didn't get made for various reasons. So no, I, I, I don't think it was a, uh, particular eye-opener for me. It was a very gratifying experience, and uh, Netflix uh, was very happy to have John and me uh, uh, promoting the show when it first uh, first came out, and we were, we were very happy with it because even though, as you say, the two main characters are sort of fictionalized versions of John and Bob, uh, they really held true to the spirit of what they were trying to do, which was really the, the, the fundamental basis of behavioral profiling, which was to go to the actual offenders, interview them, and for the first time, be able to correlate what was going on in the offender's mind before, during, and after the crime. And that really led to uh, 
profiling and criminal investigative analysis of the kind that the uh, behavioral science section of the FBI does. Oh, wow. I I have so many questions for you, Mark. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if you don't mind, um, one of my first questions that I would really like to ask is, for the Mindhunter Netflix series, did you have an opportunity to work with some of the actors such as Anna Torv and Holt McCallany? Uh, never met Anna. Um, Holt, uh, Holt actually uh, came out, uh, flew out from California, uh, where he lived at the time, to uh, to John's house in Virginia to uh, to talk to him about it and really to get some some background. So um, we were, you know, we became very friendly with uh, with both Jonathan Groff, who's a terrific guy, and and Holt Holt is as well. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, they certainly appreciated the material that uh, they were working with, and uh, I think they did a terrific job with it. Uh, oh. I, 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 you know, Jonathan is is still a friend. I just uh, corresponded with him uh, last week when uh, when he opened in Merrily We Roll Along on Broadway. Oh wow! Oh wow! Oh, that's amazing. Um, and would you mind just um taking us back just a little bit. Um, you just, you have such an impressive collection of written works, Mark, you know, from Mind Hunter to Unnatural Causes to Virus Hunter. How did you become interested in the criminal justice system and the medical fields, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, well, let's see. Um, I guess in one way, you could say that I'm interested in everything that scares me. Uh, <laughs> another way I can say I'm always interested in detective stories and the two fields that I've written the most in, which are criminal justice and public health mm -hmm. are both uh, detective stories of their type. Um, I had written four novel. I had written and published four novels um, before any of this started. So I was all, already interested in thrillers and why people do the things they do. In other words, the human condition writ large and at the extremes, if you will, Tracy. Um, and then I had been uh, writing and producing uh, some shows for Nova, the PBS science series. Right. And um, after I read Silence of the Lambs, which is sort of the uh, or document for, for many of us in this field, I went to the uh, executive producer of Nova, Paula Apsell, uh, at WGBH in Boston, and I said, Paula, um, I read this book, Silence of the Lambs. It's really an interesting novel, very compelling. I understand they're making a movie about it. Why don't we do the real story behind this FBI profiling unit? And uh, she was a little bit hesitant at first because in those days, Nova did mostly hard science, and this was psychology, a decidedly soft science. But eventually she agreed, and um, serial killers weren't really a thing yet, and this was before 9-11, so security wasn't quite as tight in the government. Mm -hmm. And I just called um, the FBI Academy in Quantico and said, I'm a producer for PBS, and can I come down and talk to you about uh, – maybe doing a show about your profilers. And they said, yeah, come on, come on down and do it. Oh, wow. Uh, so so uh, I went down with my producing partner, Larry Klein, who is a very prominent uh, PBS uh, science producer. And uh, we met with everybody and uh, we started doing research. And uh, we eventually, after following this unit for quite some time, uh, ended up producing a show called Mind of a Serial Killer, which was uh, nominated for a National Emmy Award in News and Documentary, uh, got very good ratings for PBS. Um, <clears throat> and sometime after it was on, I can't tell you how long, uh, the head of the unit, the pioneer profiler, John Douglas, called me and said, well, I'm getting ready to retire. Uh, do you think anybody would be interested in my story? And I said, well, I, I certainly would be. Uh, let's let's take a look. So I we got together. John and I got together. Uh, I did a number of recorded interviews with him, um, wrote up a proposal. Um, probably the smartest thing I did was come up with the title Mind Hunter, um, <laughs> more than any any of my actual writing, uh, brought it to uh, 
uh, my agent, and we went to New York and made presentations to uh, a number of people. And it was eventually bought by uh, the Scribner's division of Simon and Schuster. Um, and it, they, they bought it for more money than I could have imagined in my, uh, in my limited imagination. Hmm. Uh, the book became a big bestseller. And we said, well, you know, maybe we'll do another one like this. And uh, so we kind of just kept going. And I think at this point, um, the last book John and I did together, uh, When a Killer Calls, mm-hmm. I think is our 10th book together on, uh, on criminal justice. And, oh, wow. Amazing. Um, and it's not a, uh, it's not a uh, pleasant subject, but I think it's a subject which people are interested in primarily because we want to know why people do the things they do, uh, these horrible things. Um, and we've tried throughout never to glamorize the killers. I mean, there are no Hannibal Lecters in our book because there are no Hannibal Lecters in real life, mm-hmm. uh, much as we owe to Tom Harris and uh, Silence of the Lambs. And uh, we just want to show what it's really like. Uh, And as far as the other subject, uh, I had written a novel called Unnatural Causes, uh, which was a thriller set against the backdrop of the Vietnam War with a science uh, orientation. And one of the characters worked for the Centers for Disease Control. So I'd started doing some research down there. Um, Fortunately, when you get to be a writer, a lot of people are nice to you actually you know, if you uh, if you say you want to talk to the experts they'll they'll often talk to you so uh, after i wrote that novel and uh, it did pretty well um i did a film for nova kind of based on the same subject which was uh it was called what's killing the children and it followed uh, a group of epidemiologists from the centers for disease control uh through rural brazil um, as they were trying to solve a mystery um, illness that was uh, taking children. Uh, they would get sick in the middle of the night, and by the next day, they would be dead. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so we we did a uh, film called What's Killing the Children. Uh, now, I think I'm a pretty mild-mannered person, Tracy, but uh, if, you, if you look at my, if you look at my uh, Nova repertory, you're, you're going to find one thing that stands out, uh, the word kill. <laughs> We did What's Killing the Children, uh, Mind of a Serial Killer. I did one not too long ago called Who Killed Lindbergh's Baby, which oh, was wow. based on what we had done. So, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, I guess around the same time we're talking about, um, my agent got a call from uh, the agent for a man named C.J. Peters, uh, who was a doctor who had previously been with the uh, military and now was head of special pathogens for the Centers for Disease Control. And he had really been the hero of uh, Richard Preston's book, The Hot Zone. And he was ready to write his own story. So they asked me to write it with him. And um, that's kind of how I got into uh, public health writing. And the book we wrote was called Virus Hunter. Uh, we were very fortunate. The New England Journal of Medicine compared it to um, uh, Paul DeQuief's classic book, Microbe, Hunt- Microbe Hunters, which was a tremendous compliment. And um, since then, a number of uh, very prominent uh, younger um, doctors have told us that uh, reading Virus Hunter was what made them interested in uh, public health. Oh my gosh. Oh, that is amazing. And, and those subject matters. Then, are... me, I'm sorry to interrupt Tracy. And then, uh, uh, I got a call not too long after that from a friend of, uh, CJ Peters named Dr. Michael Osterholm, uh, at the university of Minnesota. And he decided he wanted to write a book with me. And Mike is one of the outstanding epidemiologists of the world. Uh, so we, we, we tried several things that didn't quite work out. And then we wrote a book which was published in 2017 called Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs, uh, which got very good reviews, uh, didn't sell many copies. And then um, when uh, COVID came along, I think in April of 2020, this book, which had sold only 8,900 copies in three years, Mm -hmm. suddenly 
it on the New York Times bestseller list. So you never know how things are going to turn out. And Mike and I are now working on another one called The Big One uh, about preparing for the an even bigger pandemic than COVID um, based on what we've learned and more importantly, what we haven't learned from uh, the COVID pandemic. So, you know, mysteries that can kill you, I guess, are kind of what I specialize in. Oh my gosh. When is that book due out? Do you have a date? <laughs> well, we've been, uh, we're, we're already late on it because uh, events keep overtaking us, but uh, mm-hmm. I suspect it'll be out sometime late next year. And um, it's somewhat retrospective on COVID, but really looking ahead to what we need to do if we're going to um, have a chance against a pandemic, which is a question of not if, but when, and probably on the order of the 1918 um, to 1920 influenza, great influenza pandemic, which killed more people than any other um, public health uh, crisis in history. And we could be looking at another one only with a population uh, roughly three and a half to four times the size with instant uh, transportation and uh, from one country to another mm-hmm. with an inter just-in-time supply chain, uh, encroachment on uh, uh, natural habitats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the problem is if we're not prepared, Tracy, a um, hundred years of medical developments uh, since 1918 are not going to prepare us any better than what we've, uh, than what we experienced then, where somewhere between 50 and a hundred million people died. Oh, wow. Oh, I look forward to that book when that comes out. Thank you so much for sharing all that with me. (laughs) We've been working on it for quite some time. (laughs) Oh, Bruce, I'm sorry. You go ahead. (laughs) No, no. Uh, Mark, I wanted to step back a moment. You mentioned that you've met two of the actors, uh, Mm -hmm. primary actors, Holt uh, McCallany and Jonathan Groff. Mm -hmm. You have not met Anna Torv, uh, an no, excellent uh, actress. Actually, we we just dis- John and I decided that we would stay away from the set and not try to uh, influence or intimidate anybody. And we decided, well, we'll finally make our appearance in the third season. So we actually haven't been on the set. The the, the, the whole series is filmed mostly in and around Pittsburgh, um, mm. and we were planning on going this time. So uh, yeah, um, Jonathan and Holt, we've gotten to know off the set yeah she's a very good actress she was a star of fringe an excellent show on fox for a few seasons she was also in the very successful the last of us she played a a couple of episodes uh, a a key player who unfortunately like a lot of people in the show didn't last very long because of the the plague that was going on but uh she's terrific as are McCallany and and Jonathan Groff. I'm curious Mark about the two uh agents. Uh, uh Anna Torv plays a psychologist. Yeah. McCallany plays agent Bill Tench, Groff plays yeah. agent Holden Ford. Yeah. Supposedly they are based on John Douglas and Robert Ressler, the two Correct. real life FBI agents. So which is which? Uh well, Jonathan is the John Douglas character and Holt is the uh, is the Robert Ressler character. And that mainly has to do with the fact that John was uh, younger. He was more impulsive. Uh, uh, Bob had uh, was, was an older agent. He had been in the military police before going to the uh, FBI. He was a little more cautious and uh, kind of understood uh, the ropes. But when John suggested that they start going into uh, uh, the penitentiaries while they were on these what they called road schools where they would teach local police departments FBI techniques uh, usually one week in one place and one week in another place um, and John said to uh, to Bob look you know you can only hang around so many bars drink so many margaritas why don't we use our time and just use our FBI creds and and go into the penitentiaries where these guys are uh, and just come in unannounced and see if they'll see us. And to his credit, um, Bob went along with it, uh, knowing more about the bureaucracy than John did. He said, yeah, look, it's always easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. So let's just do it. And um, out of that came a uh, a study of uh, 36 
uh, serial killers and violent mm. offenders, which eventually became uh, th- where they published as an academic book called Sexual Homicide Patterns and Motives. And from there, they developed the uh, the crime classification manual, which is sort of like the DSM, the Diagnostic and St- St- Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, but for uh, police officers and detectives. And um, the third character you mentioned, Anna, uh, the psychologist, is actually based on a uh, woman named Ann Burgess, who uh, who mm-hmm. taught psychiatric nursing and still does uh, at Boston Univer- at Boston College. And she was the one who really organized the study that they all did. Um, it wasn't um, she's um, doesn't quite fit the profile that uh, Anna did in the film, but uh, but Anne was 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 very influential and very important uh, in in developing these studies, and uh, and she's still she's still active. Robert and I, West and and Anne and Anne is a big fan of Anna Torgolov's too. Yeah, Robert Ressler passed away. I want to say about ten years ago. Did you get to know him pretty well? No, I, I, I didn't. Uh, he was already retired by the time that, uh, that I came on the scene. I, I, I knew most of the others of that era very well. Um, people like Roy Hazelwood and Ken Lanning, who, uh, respectively were the experts on interpersonal violence and crimes against children. But, um, Bob had already retired by the time, um, I came along. So prior to Douglas and Ressler and the psychologist Burgess that you mentioned, was there any kind of profiling or anything similar to profiling done in the FBI or were these folks complete groundbreakers? No, there there were uh, there there were some uh, early attempts. Um, Probably the um, the beginning was um, somebody known as the. as the mad bomber of New York, uh, George Metesky, uh, and the police went to a local Greenwich Village psychiatrist to see if they could uh, help uh, figure it out. And it seems like a fairly uh, routine case now of figuring out uh, um, who the offender would be. Uh, he said he uh, he famously said uh, uh, the the offender will you'll find him living with uh, older female relatives. Uh, he'll be very neat. Um, and when uh, you see him, he will uh, be wearing a double-breasted suit button. Uh, and it was pretty pretty accurate, uh, as it turns out. Um, and then um, uh, the first generation of uh, profilers, um, Harold T- uh, Howard Teton and Dick Alt, who were uh, FBI agents at, at Quantico, they sort of did informal uh, profiling as, as as part of their jobs. But it really wasn't until John and Bob came along that uh, that they had an actual uh, pro- uh, a formal program that uh, police officers and detectives and sheriff's departments could submit their material to and uh, and actually get profiles uh, and as well as profile people think of profiles which of course is important but also um, the kind of strategic uh, uh, investigative techniques that could help uh, identify and and flush out a a killer or a violent offender I believe you mentioned they interviewed 36 killers right uh, they've they've done a lot more since then but that was the initial study yeah yeah and if you remember from the first season of uh, uh, of Mindhunter, and um, uh, and 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 uh, and Edwin um, Kemper, Kemper was the was the first one, and uh, he was uh, he was very cooperative, and uh, he's very interesting because he was also very insightful. He's the only serial killer I could th- I can think of who, um, when he finished what he wanted to do, which was killing a series of co-eds at the University of California at Santa Cruz. And then finally getting up the courage to do what he really wanted to do, which was to kill his mother. Um, he turned himself in and mm. um, can't think of another serial killer who's done that. And I also understand that Ed's been in prison since uh, since the 1980s, at least, I think. No, pro- no, the 1970s. Um, and my understanding is that he has uh, uh, foregone parole consideration. He's, um, he thinks he's better off where he is. 
leads perfectly into my next question, because one of the things that strikes me about the show, the very disturbing portrayals of characters like Ed Kemper and Charles Manson. I mean, Kemper is obviously highly intelligent, but that kind of scares you that someone that intelligent is a serial killer because kind of shows what they're capable of doing. And then, you know, the, the, the insanity, the craziness of, of Charles Manson. And, and there was an interesting thing in the series about uh, somebody said, uh, you know, don't mention anything about his height. He's very, uh, conscious of being short i guess he was like five foot four or something yeah, but he was very he was very conscious of it and in fact as soon as uh, they started the interview uh, uh manson climbed up on the back of a chair so that he could be above the uh, eye line of both um uh, of, of both john and bob looking and at those two guys though i'll say one more thing it scared me watching i mean those yeah. guys it seemed like they were on the money and and it yeah the, really the, captured them the killers were david fincher decided to portray the killers as their real selves and they were eerily accurate uh manson uh um kemper uh jerry brudos uh i think if we'd gone any further you certainly started to get uh, some hints of uh, Dennis Rader, the BTK strangler. So, yeah, um, I, I think they did a terrific job on the um, on the offenders without without making them into heroic figures, which, of course, they're not. Uh, this is such a fascinating conversation. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, the other thing Bruce probably hasn't told you that uh, we also we also bonded over um, baseball and uh I have a mystery that I told him about um, <laughs> this diversion. One time when I was up at the Hall of Fame, uh, I went into the, uh, it was during the week, so that I went into the research department and I said, you know, I'm just a fan, but I, I have a question for you. Is it true that arguably the most famous baseball in the history of the sport, the 1951 Bobby Thompson shot her around the world in the playoff game between the Dodgers and the Giants. No one has ever come forward with that ball, um, even though it's probably the greatest souvenir in the history of the sport. And they said, yes, we have no idea what happened to it. Oh, my gosh. Really? <laughs> does that square with what you know? Uh, it does. Perhaps we can have the FBI work on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a little late for that. Yeah. I'll let, anyway, it would be a far I, less I important regret. issue. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the show the show is terrific. Uh, Nineteen episodes over the two seasons. I do hope there will be more. Whether that happens in two years, four years, six years, we don't know. But it it, it deserves more airtime. There are more stories to be told, and and hopefully your involvement will continue to be critical to that. Uh, let's transition to another subject. And as it turns out, this man was a baseball fan, also Rod Serling. This is a fascinating aspect of your life and your career, your relationship with him. You knew him. Tell us about meeting Rod Serling, creator of the Twilight Zone for the first time, when and where it happened. Well, this was, uh, this was probably very um, influential in my career or inspirational in, in, in various ways uh, that I'm probably still discovering. Um, I was a huge Twilight Zone fan as a, uh, as a young teenager and uh, I, in the 1960s. And uh, I thought at that point I wanted to be a writer and television seemed like a good place to be a writer. And um, I just became kind of fixated on the Twilight Zone and fascinated by it and, uh, and uh, fixated on Rod as a result. In fact, I think you know, I come from the generation that I said that grew up in the 1960s um, that thought um, every that was uh, idealistic enough to think anything was possible and cynical enough to think nothing was true. So mm -hmm. I think shows like The Twilight Zone certainly encouraged that kind of thing. So it just so happened that my mother, who was a, um, <clears throat> a school teacher um, by profession, had been uh, doing work with the uh, local um, American University radio station, which was then in the early days of what became National Public Radio. It was just called uh, um, Greater Washington Educational Radio in those days, I think, in Washington, D.C. 
And at the time, um, Rod was the president of the uh, Academy of Television uh, and Motion Picture, no, no, tele- the Academy of Television uh, Arts and Sciences that gave out the Emmy Awards, which I was fortunate enough to win one eventually. Um, and she found out through this, uh, through her radio contacts, that um, Rod was going to be giving a speech at the uh, at one of the local hotels to the local chapter of the uh, Television Academy. So she said, "Let's we can, we can go." And I was absolutely thrilled uh, when I got there. Rod was already sitting at the uh, front table with his uh, brother Bob, who also was a writer. I timidly approached with my paperback copy of Stories from the Twilight Zone and asked him to sign it. And he immediately engaged me in conversation. And um, he was so genuine and so forthcoming and and generous that it was just really impressive to me. And, And I don't remember what he talked about. I know I was spellbound. And I wanted to talk to him afterwards, Um, but he and Bob rushed out right afterwards. I found out somewhat later, maybe the next day, that he had gone right to the hospital because he had been having chest pains the whole time and was afraid he was having a heart attack. So um, I sent him a get well card um, uh, at the hospital and um, and didn't think any much much more about it. I was just thrilled to have met my hero once. And um, maybe 10 days later, I got a letter back from him saying that uh, he really appreciated the the card. It was the best medicine he had. And uh, it was just very friendly. So that gave me the courage to continue writing to him. And we developed a uh, a relationship, uh, a relationship that lasted for 10 years from the um from the time i was 14 to the time i was 24 which was when he died and i saw him in california when i was out there at his house i saw him several occasions in washington and we kept up our correspondence and once i got out of college and actually became a writer i proposed to him i said you know i think somebody should write a book about you and i think it should be me <laughs> and uh, he wrote me back a letter which has been actually reprinted several times in various sources saying, um, how can I respond to the ultimate of compliments? But I'm afraid you'd find that uh, uh, publishers really aren't interested in what, I, what I've done. Um, but of course, if, they, uh, if you find that they are, you know, you absolutely have my blessing and I'll cooperate with you in any way I can. Well, as it turns out, Rod was right. Um, We couldn't sell the book. Um, There have been, he would be stunned by, amazed by how many books are out about him now and what a hero he has become. Um, So that book never got written, but uh, my relationship continued with him until he died in 1975 when I was 24. And, um, I've kind of been mourning his death ever since. I'm, as you know, I'm close friends with his daughter, Anne, who's a few years younger than me. Um, and I think his writing has had a profound uh, influence and inspiration on my career, Bruce. Well, this is really heartwarming to hear about this relationship. You were a young kid, a teenager, meeting a celebrity. Him and he was, you know, completely generous and supportive. Uh, I sent him scripts which he read and, and commented on. So, um, aside from the um, kind of stiff, spooky image that we see on television, this was one of uh, nature's noblemen, no, no question about it, um, and one of the um, great, great uh, fighters for for human dignity as as uh and and equality as you as you know from having attended the conferences yeah i've always heard he was down to earth humble everything you said really emphasizes that's correct well in fact one time i said rod all these things that you write about in the twilight zone um d- do you wish they would really happen in real life and he said yes but not to me <laughs> oh my God. good answer <laughs> You mentioned his passing. He died after multiple heart attacks. I believe it was 1975, if I'm not mistaken. You were 24. 
Mm-hmm. You must have been absolutely heartbroken when you heard the news. Absolutely. I was, I was devastated. Um, and, um, you know, I don't, it was like, um, somebody who I had counted on to be, um, my mentor and guide throughout my career was, was suddenly taken away from me. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like this was all about me, but, um, but on the same, by the same token, so many of us felt this loss completely personally. You mentioned that you were already a big fan of the Twilight Zone before you met him, but he did so many other good things. Night Gallery was an underrated show. He was screenwriter for a number of films, including the original Planet of the Apes from 1968. And and Seven Days Days in May as well. Yes. I assume Twilight Zone was was your favorite work of his. What might have been second on the list? Well, I I think it it certainly was. but I think he did a lot of other things. I, I mean, Requiem for Heavyweight and Patterns and uh, The Rack and uh, The Strike, all of those uh, uh, In the Presence of Mine Enemies, all those shows he did for original live television were, uh, were, were very influential. And uh, toward the end of his life, he, um, I think he was moving away from television and uh, moving toward um, – narrative writing i know he wanted to uh write some plays for uh for the theater and also i remember i visited him uh this is probably like 1971 maybe um and he showed me uh, a manuscript uh that he had that he was writing um based on his uh television play uh, a storm in summer um, now, what's interesting is um, that manuscript has never surfaced anywhere in any of his archives, hmm. and yet um, Anne and I have uh, have compared notes. And several weeks after I was there, she got a letter from him. She was at boarding school, and he said, "I think you're going to be impressed by uh, this novel I'm writing." And we both concluded it had to be it had to be the same one. So um, I think he. Uh, he had written a he had written a book of three novellas called uh, the season to be wary, which eventually um, uh, became the basis for Night Gallery, and uh, I think he was uh, he was seriously moving into um, into narrative fiction, and if you look at um, the season to be wary, um, which by the way we've uh, Rod Serling books, which Anne and her husband uh, Doug Sutton have. Um, uh, reanimated um oh. i wrote the uh, introduction for the reprint reprint of the season to be wary as well as uh, requiem for a heavyweight and if you look at the um his novelization of requiem for a heavyweight and then look at um the three novellas in season to be wary i think you see a tremendous uh, uh um increase in sophistication of uh of narrative writing and i think had rod lived um he would have become a great novelist as well mark i've always heard that rod did not like hollywood he didn't like the culture the lifestyle maybe even some of the people that wasn't for him is that true i think he had mixed feelings about it he had a very nice house in pacific palisades with a uh, paddle tennis court in a swimming pool and his office was out back and so he certainly uh he certainly enjoyed the appurtenances of the good life um but it's also true that uh he and Anne particularly but also uh Anne's sister Jody and uh Rod's wife Carol looked forward every year to spending the summer at this little cabin um on the shores of uh, Lake Cayuga up in uh up um, right north of uh, Ithaca New York mm-hmm. so uh yeah i think he had very mixed feelings about that um he certainly saw through hollywood for what it was um was willing to take the money and stay and i i see nothing wrong with that and um according to ann uh he would make uh, several trips back to his uh, hometown of Binghamton every summer and just look around. And you see from so much of his uh, writing on the Twilight Zone, particularly the epic episode Walking Distance, how um, that search for childhood and that search for this idyllic beginning uh, 
ne never left him. And when you think of the fact that uh, the day after he graduated from high school, he enlisted in the military, in the, in the army, and um, was sent to the Philippines in World War II, um, certainly lost his innocence there. Um, you see why he would have had that uh, nostalgia for the way things used to be. He was a guy that was very willing to speak out about social causes. He would incorporate those into his various writings, into his TV shows. He was probably one of the first guys on television uh, that really tried to get across, you know, messages against racism. There's also a famous quote attributed to him about drug use. And he said, if you need to use drugs to be a good writer, you're not a good writer. Yeah, he said he said yeah. a lot of things like that, and uh, you're absolutely right. He considered uh, prejudice to be the great evil of all time, and that did not start with his writing. Um, uh, I knew a man who I, I met through um, a club I belonged to in Washington, uh, who had um, he was an economist, and he had gone to uh, he had gone to Antioch with um, Rod and Carol. And, and and kept up with him to a certain extent. And then uh, one time when Anne came to Washington, I arranged to have, for her to have lunch with this guy, Mike. And he told us the story. He said, when we were in, at Antioch in um, Yellow Springs, Ohio, there were two barber shops in town. One would only cut white people's hair and one would mm. cut anybody's hair. He said, and Rod... Um, not only organized, but practically enforced um, a program um, or demonstration or reaction, whatever you want to call it, to boycott this barber shop that would not cut black people's hair. Mm. So that's just one example of, uh, of his commitment. Tracy, I know you're a huge fan of science fiction and, and a guy like Sterling, he really crosses both the genres, uh, horror, which of course is my big thing. And yet he also crosses into sci-fi. And that's one of the great things about and Sterling. I would also add fantasy to that as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I've just been going over in my head some of my favorite Twilight Zone episodes. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just curious, do you have a favorite Twilight Zone episode that you can think of offhand? I, ha I probably have uh, five or six. Um, Walking Distance, which I mentioned, um, is, mm -hmm. is certainly one of them. Probably one of the most hard-hitting um, is one called Death's Head Revisited, where Rod wrote about a um, former SS officer who goes back to Dachau after the war and uh, just to reminisce about his uh, good times there. And he is confronted, as it turns out, by the ghosts of the prisoners who he has had killed there. And uh, it ends up with a uh, a resolution which couldn't happen in real life, but is so much more fitting and just than anything that could happen in real life that um, I think it's it's one that all of us uh, appreciate. There's so many there's so many of them, and you know I got to the point where on the reruns I could see probably eight seconds of an episode, and I could tell you, oh well, that's the one where such and such happens. Um, <laughs> yeah, I. Um, my my uh, younger brother, Robert, who's a doctor who went to MIT while he was in college, he became a big Star Trek, Trek fan. Mm -hmm. And as soon as uh, William Shatner or um, Patrick Stewart would say, you know, Captain's Log, Star Date, whatever, my brother Robert could say, oh, that's the one where such and such happens. So, yeah, there's a uh, um, there's a, a good tradition. And um, uh, one great pleasure for me was uh, I became. Um, Maybe 30 years ago when I was doing a film um, in London, uh, in, in England called Discovering Hamlet, um, I was introduced to Patrick Stewart and Patrick and I became good friends uh, over the years. And uh, I was thrilled that at one point, um, finally, when Patrick was appearing on Broadway, I got to introduce um, Anne to Patrick. And uh, so oh. I mean, full circle. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's amazing to hear. Patrick Stewart is one of my favorite, favorite. Well, and also another great guy. Um, totally, uh, totally generous, very smart, very, uh, very introspective. Um, uh, narr narrated uh, two films for me. So um, um, 
Yes, Patrick is a good friend. Oh, nice. Mark, I had one final question on Rod Serling. What yeah. makes his work stand up? It's nearly 50 years since he passed away. He's as relevant today, maybe more popular today than ever. Why is that? I think because um, what he wrote about was so universal. Um, we probably didn't even realize it at the time, but um, he his stories were so basic and so and yet so sophisticated about the primary dimensions of the human condition um, that what he wrote was essentially universal. Um, I don't even know if he realized that um, at the time. He certainly was not the best um, arbiter of his own talent. Um, he didn't think he'd accomplished that much. He was completely wrong about that. Um, mm. But all of these Twilight Zone episodes, 156 of them, 92 of which Rod wrote himself, uh, these rem rem remain half-hour morality plays. Um, and they are as I would submit that they are as relevant in their own way to our age as, uh, as Shakespeare is. That's very interesting. And I think very accurate. I'm a big Shakespeare fan too. So I, yeah. I, I don't make that statement lightly. Yeah. Final question for you, Mark, you know, you've done so many great books, you've written novels, you've written books based on your work with John Douglas and the FBI. You've certainly set the stage for the Mindhunter TV series. Uh, you've done documentaries. What's next for you? What What's the next project that's on the docket? I'll have um, another um, book or two in criminal justice that I'd like to write, um, mainly about um, how people resolve the unresolvable. I mean, the one thing that, uh, uh, the one word that victims of crime and their survivors don't like to hear is closure because it uh, it doesn't mean anything. There's never such a thing as closure. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten very close to a lot of victims and their families uh, over the years through my work with John. And so I'd like to write a book about um, what what happens instead of closure. What what are the mm -hmm. what are the alternatives? And they're different for for everybody. Sometimes it means forgiveness. Sometimes it means um, trying to get uh, their loved one's killer executed. Sometimes it means restorative justice. There are all kinds of different ways, but I'd like to write a book about that. And then after that, um, I'd really like to see at my age if I can go back to novel writing. I haven't done it for about 20 years, and I just want to see if I still have the chops to write a few more novels. You know, you mentioned the families. I think of the Natalie Holloway story, and of course, sure. we recently had a major development there. Yeah. Mark, you still with us? No, that's very true. And so, you know, everybody's different, but everybody suffers the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before I let you go, um, we do hope that Mindhunter does continue at some point. Uh, if it does, I think it would be great if you could get a cameo and be on set and be on camera. Is that something that is a goal of yours? I'd love to um, see it. Well, I... It, it, I, I wouldn't object to it. I, you know, I could do the Hitchcock thing. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would, I would, uh, I would do that. I think John would too. That'd be great. Uh -huh. Our guest has been, uh, Mark Olshaker. Uh, he is an Emmy award winner. He's, uh, really laid the foundation for the mind Hunter TV show has written many books, uh, about the FBI working with his longtime friend, John Douglas, uh, he has done documentaries, uh, a terrific career, and one that we hope uh, continues for many more years. Mark, we really appreciate your time this past hour. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Tracy. Uh, you're great hosts. Uh, thank thank you. you. This has been amazing, and we definitely appreciate you being here today. Again, our thanks go to our guest, Mark Olshaker, appearing here on the Ghostly Gallery podcast. We thank Tracy for being with us as well. Tracy, of course, co-host and producer for the show. We want to thank all of the listeners for being part of the audience in this Museum of the Macabre. And we hope you'll join us next time right here in the Ghostly Gallery.